Friends, we want to welcome you again to Covenant City Church's online service. Now, not knowing the direction of where this pandemic uh, was going to go about a month ago, we did announce that we're going to do these online services up into today, March 29th. But now seeing how things are progressing, it seems like we may need to extend uh, these online worship services indefinitely, and we just have to see how things progress and, and when it is we can meet together as a church. And we do long to do that. We long to gather back together uh, with you and worship the Lord physically gathered here in the church uh, in, in person, but unfortunately, we can't uh, do that just yet. And as I mentioned uh, last week, I know that Staying attuned to a, an online worship service is a little bit more difficult than compared if you're here in person. Uh, and although I picture my kids jumping all over me tomorrow as I try to pay attention uh, to this worship service, I do want to invite us to control uh, the things that we can control so that our attentions will be focused uh, in, in worshiping God in this time. Some of the things we can do uh, to, to help ourselves be in tune is to turn off our devices and enter into a posture of worship. Other things we can do is that uh, when the songs come up and the, you can find the lyrics on the bottom of the screen for us to join and sing along out loud uh, from the comforts of our own home. And also when there are Bible passages that you're invited to read out loud to join and read out loud uh, with us. And also truly lift up our hearts to God when we uh, in this worship service go to him in prayer. So encourage us all to, to worship him. And before we begin our time of worship, please join me in a time of prayer. Father, we come to you trying to make best with uh, the situation we've been given. And I beg you that as we preach your word and we sing songs that communicate truths about your word, and as we read out loud your word, and as we um, read out loud statement of faiths, that summarize your word, I pray that the truths in your eternal word will speak deeply into our hearts and that your spirit will make it effective for the glory of your name. And I pray that you would comfort our hearts in this time of distress and that you lead us back to you and remind us of the one who has all things under control in the palm of his hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Him. None above 
of him, none before him, all of time in his hands. And for his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory. the future brings and I will watch and wait for the Savior King then my joy complete standing face to face in the presence of the Join me as we read aloud together our call to worship. For all of you that are at home, I encourage you to read it alone together with me as shown on the screen below. Please read together with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter begins our call to worship today by highlighting the great mercy of God towards Christians. And God's great mercy to Christians is demonstrated in the reality of their new birth, their regeneration, their being born again, and transformed from a state of darkness to a state of death and life. And believers are now God's spiritual children who, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, have been given a living hope, a hope that is both sure and certain, a hope that is certain even in the midst of the various trials and sufferings that we might experience in this life. And the certainty of our hope lies in the fact that it is an eternal hope, a hope that Peter describes as an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, for believers of every age. And not only does Peter say that this spiritual inheritance is reserved for us, but he also says that we ourselves are being guarded guarded by God, God himself, in the very day that we receive that inheritance. And so Peter wants to assure us that the purpose of our trials in this present life are for a reason. The trials of believers in this life are not without a purpose, whether we understand it or not. 
And the reason that Peter gives us for our trials in our passage this morning is so that the genuineness of our faith might be demonstrated, resulting in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so the goal, God's goal, in all of our trials and the trials of believers is to confirm the genuineness of our faith. And he does so by exposing us to a variety of trials. And so Peter wants Christians to be comforted, knowing that God not only purposes the specific kind of trials that they experience in this life, but he also purposes the length and duration of all of our trials as well. And Peter tells us in verse 6 then to rejoice because our trials are only for a little while, especially in light of eternity. And since we know that God has a purpose for everything that we experience in this life as Christians, Peter, in our confession of sin today, tells us just how we should respond in our times of trial. Let's read aloud together our confession of sin, taken from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Let's read together. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Let us now go to the Lord and confess our sins that we might find forgiveness. Hear now, Father, our silent prayers of confession. Father, we thank you for giving us an inheritance, Lord, an inheritance that is guarded for us, O Lord, in heaven. Forgive us, O Lord, for our sins, Lord. Forgive us for our unworthiness. Forgive us, O Lord, uh, for sins of thought and deed. We are not all that we should be, Lord. Our faith is weak in the midst of our trials. And Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us, Lord, particularly during these times of uh, trial, Lord, throughout the world, that you would give us the faith, O Lord, that endures. Thank you so much, Lord, that you sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins, Lord, to be a sacrifice, Lord, on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, that he had faith where we did not. And in him, Lord, we are righteous in your sight. We thank you, Father. We ask that you would forgive us for our sins. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, our assurance of pardon today comes from 1 Peter. And it reminds us once again of God's great mercy to us in regeneration. A mercy that has not only transformed our hearts, but has also transformed our actions as well. And through his great mercy, Christians, believers, have now become God's very own chosen people, a special people, a people that are united in spirit and in truth, a brotherhood made up of believers of every age, race, and nationality. Christian, hear now your assurance of pardon that comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. A 
sweet relief for every pain I feel. But oh, when gloomy doubts prevail, I fear to call me mine. The springs of comfort seem to fail, and all Yet, gracious God, where shall I flee? Thou art my only trust. And still my soul would cleave to Thee, though prostrate in the dark. Hast Thou not bid me see? Shall I seek in vain? And can the ear of sovereign grace be deaf when I complain? No, still the ear of sovereign grace attends the mourner's prayer. to breathe my sorrows there. Thy mercy seat is open still. Here let my soul retreat. With humble hope attend thy will and wait beneath mercy seat. Thy mercy seat is open still. Here let my soul retreat. With humble hope attend thy will and wait beneath thy feet. Thy mercy seat. Thy mercy seat is open still. So retreats with humble hope, attend thy will and wait beneath thy feet. Our statement of faith today comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, questions 27 and 28. I'll read the questions, and we'll read aloud the answers together. Question 27. What do you understand by the providence of God? God's providence is his mighty, almighty, and ever-present power, whereby, as with his hand, he still upholds heaven and earth and all creatures, and so governs them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, food and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty. Indeed, all things come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Question 28. What does it benefit us to know that God has created all things and still upholds them by his providence? Answer. We can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and with a view to the future, we can have a firm confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature shall separate us from his love. For all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will, they cannot so much as move. Friends, literally everybody is affected uh, by this by this bizarre season of life. And perhaps the biggest effect that we all feel, aside from health complications, obviously, is the financial complications that this time of social distancing and, and, and quarantine is bringing about. So Christian, my encouragement to you is to use much wisdom um, 
and find out how it is God called you to continue to give uh, to your local church in this time. The amount may change. It may not change. I, I don't know your situation. I don't know what faithfulness looks like specifically for you. But I do want to encourage you to continually support and sustain your local church as best as you can so that it can survive this hard season and continue God's work of preaching God's word to the world and also preaching God's word into the hearts of its members. And also, as I said last week, if you're not a member at CCC and you're a member at another church, then don't feel obligated to give to us. But you should, I think, try your best to continue to give to your local church whatever church that may be, so that you can support and sustain their work, not only during this hard season, but also after, after uh, this season. But if you are a member at CCC, then I do want to encourage you to, again, as best as you can, to sustain God's work here through this local body by continuing your giving and your tithes to this church. Okay, before I move on into our sermon, uh, let me close this time through a prayer of intercession. Please pray with me. Father, we come to you and we try our best to lift up our eyes to Calvary and calm our anxieties, not knowing what the future holds, but yet we know that you hold the future. And we know that if the gospel is true, you have a glorious future in mind, no matter how hard and difficult the road there may be. And we pray that you remind us of the eternal truths as it is revealed in your holy word. And now as we preach it, and as we study it, and as we sing it, and as we recite it, it would seep deeper and deeper into our hearts, comforting us, not uh, through finite ways uh, that can disappear uh, today or tomorrow, but eternally. Let us have a taste of that eternal peace now, if you would give us that mercy. And Father, we pray for other churches in the city, that you'd also sustain them, that you, through their local members, would would continue to help them continue their work, and that they would come out of this uh, season of life at least, um, at least surviving. And Father, we pray also for the city and, and this country and this world and the health that we desperately need. I pray that a vaccine <laughs> may come about. I pray that uh, countries would get over the curb quickly I pray that not many more fatalities and health complications and financial hardships and other things would result from this. I pray for all those who are struggling in many ways because of this quarantine, that you would be with them and that you would have an extra dose of mercy and grace upon them. And Father, I pray ultimately that those who claim to be yours, that those who believe in the gospel, those who receive Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would strengthen them, give them a power and an assurance and a shalom that goes beyond the situation in which they are in now. Only you can grant us that. And we beg you that as you grant us that, we don't use that peace just for the sake of existential comfort selfishly, but so that we may have emotional room, uh, cognitive space, and physical strength, therefore, to serve others and love others, and care for others, and minister to others, and counsel others, as they also are suffering in the same way we all are. Pray for the government of the city, that they would, and of this country, that they would lead uh, us through this time wisely, um, committing to their vows to serve those who they have promised to serve when they took office. Give us comfort, give us peace, and Father, we pray. Uh, in the way that you have taught your disciples to pray as we end this time of intercessory prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, we do have a few announcements before we continue in our time of worship. Uh, Children's ministry, I know it's been on pause for the past few weeks, but we are wanting to do something uh, for our uh, families and for the children in our congregation. Uh, So parents, uh, 
check your WhatsApps, check your emails. You're going to be hearing from our Shones Ministry staff if you're a parent and you're a member at CCC about how we're going to do this. It's going to include a fun video about the Bible or about a particular book of the Bible, and then also going to book questions for you to discuss with your children about the video. And it's going to be sent out to you uh, either Thursday or, or Friday or Saturday of the week for you to then use on Sunday uh, to lead your children and your family in, in worshiping God as well. So keep, keep an eye out for that. Second announcement is that uh, we do have our mercy ministry efforts uh, active in this time, and, and a lot of it is, is, is relief funding, where we're helping organizations that uh, in the front lines in the city trying to, trying to fight this, this uh, pandemic. We're partnering with two organizations specifically, and one of them supplies masks for frontline medical workers to help them uh, d- during this crisis so that uh, they can continue to help others. We've been able to provide over 800 masks uh, for various hospitals and, and thank, thank God uh, uh, for, for the help and for you guys supporting through that. At this time, that organization is no longer taking uh, uh, any more donations because they're focusing on distribution. But the other one, uh, and I, the, the account number and the name will be, will be on the screen below. The other one, uh, Care for Indonesia, they're also supplying medical supplies, masks, and, and things like that to hospitals and to other places that need it. And they are still taking donations at this time. CCC is going to continue to give uh, uh, from our institution to them. But we also want to encourage you, our members, or anyone that's, that's uh, listening to this video, to continue to give or start giving to Care for Indonesia as they provide uh, health care supplies for the medical workers, and four hospitals throughout Indonesia to help those who are in need. And again, the bank account and information will be on the screen below you. Last announcement is that uh, the ministry staff at CCC is going to uh, provide daily devotions, uh, and it's going to be provided and posted on YouTube daily, every morning, about 10-minute uh, devotion that one of, our, one of our ministry staff will be doing, will be rotating doing that, so that hopefully our members uh, and anybody who wants to partake in it will be blessed by God's Word uh, uh, 10 to 15 minutes every day in the morning. So please be on the lookout for that. And actually, I do have one more announcement. If you are a member at CCC and you are experiencing a particular need or help, uh, we do have uh, uh, an ability to, to see if we can help, uh, whether, whether that's financial or anything else. If, if, you are, if you do find yourself in that situation during this confusing time, please contact the church, email us, go to our website, contact one of the staff, your community group leaders, and they'll be able to get you connected to the people necessary for us to be able to help uh, uh, our members who are in need. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and, and read our scripture for today. Take it from Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 12, and then we're going to move on to our sermon. Originally, we were going to do the book of Romans, but we're choosing to do Job for the next few weeks, and, and I think because it's, it, it's relevant, especially for a time like this. So let me, let me read Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 12, uh, and then we will continue in our, in our sermon. Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 12, this is the word of God. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one of his day, and they would send and invite uh, their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, 
Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Let me pray for us before we continue in our sermon. Father, help us understand your word. Help us grasp what you're trying to say from it and change our paradigm and align our worldviews to the one the Bible presents. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, why did we decide to do Job? Well, of course, Job and every other book in the Bible, it's relevant in all times and all seasons, but particularly we feel its relevance that's felt even more so now, in the season that we're in now, as it addresses, I think, a lot of the questions that a lot of us may be having right now. And depending on where you're coming from, the questions may vary. Perhaps some of you are asking, how does a biblical worldview make sense of the season of suffering that we're in? How does the Bible make sense of that? Some of us may ask, how does God want me to live in, in this season of suffering? Others maybe ask, why would God even let something like this happen in the first place? And wherever it is you're coming from, whatever questions you might have, I hope that you find in this book either a direct answer for it or at least an indirect address of it. And I hope that you have a clear understanding of who God is as the Bible claims him to be through this book. So before we begin, I want to encourage you to keep your Bibles open on Job chapter 1 verses 1 to 12 because we're going to be referring back to it a lot during the sermon. There's three things that I'll point out from the passage today. First point, life's messy middle. Second point, Job's unknown motivation. And third point, God's sure conclusion. Life's messy middle, Job's unknown motivation, and God's sure conclusion. Let's start with our first point. Life's messy middle. Okay, since this is the first sermon in the series, let me just give us some context of the book of Job, okay? So imagine all the books in the Bible, all all 66 books, are separate individual books. So 66 books in, in this long bookshelf, okay? If you imagine that, you can divide this 66 books on the, on the bookshelf into two general parts. First is the Old Testament and then the New Testament. The Old Testament has 39 books in them and the New Testament has 27 books in them. Okay, so let's focus now on, on the Old Testament, okay, because that's where the book of Job is. Now, in these 39 books in the Old Testament, it can be, these books can be broken down even further, okay? So there's a collection of the first five books called the Torah, and then there's a historical book section which talks about Israel's history, And then there's a collection of books called uh, the Prophets that has the minor and the major prophets in them. And finally, there's a section in the Old Testament, which where Job is in, called the poetic or the wisdom literature books of the Old Testament. Okay, and in this section of of wisdom literature, you'll find books like Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon's. Now, if you want to understand the book of Job, you you got to start reading it through the lenses of this particular section in the Old Testament. Okay, you got to compare it to other books in this section, specifically to the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. The book of Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes essentially asks the same question, and it's this. Whether or not there is fairness in the universe, is that a thing? Is that how God governs and operates the world? If so, then, for example, why are both good and bad people suffering equally in this bizarre viral outbreak? And in some cases, we may observe that good people are suffering even more than bad people. Is fairness a thing? Now, (coughs) the book of Proverbs seemed to take a more simpler perspective on this question, and the book of Proverbs simply says, yes, it is. Fairness is a thing, right? If you you read the book of Proverbs, you'll quickly see that it repeats over and over again You know, the wise or the righteous, they prosper, and the foolish and the unrighteous, they suffer. It's simple, right? So so you see it through the book of of Proverbs, the eyes of the book of Proverbs, and, and it's pretty clear that the world can be understood through this simple principle of retribution. The good in in this life gets blessed, and if you're bad in this life, you you get cursed. Okay? Now, this is confusing because if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, which, by the way, comes, comes right after the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, it seems to be saying the exact opposite. What does it say over and over again? You remember it? 
vanity to vanity, right? It doesn't matter. You can be wise, you can be foolish, you can be righteous, you can be unrighteous, you can be good, you can be bad. We all get sick, we all suffer and die, good and bad alike. The principle of retribution is simply not true. That, that's what Ecclesiastes seem to be claiming. Those who are good suffer, and those who are bad may prosper. At the end, it's random, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so which one is right? Proverbs or Ecclesiastes? Well, upon this backdrop, the book of Job now comes in. And it says that they're both true. How so? Well, well, with this backdrop now in mind, let's look at verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. So here we see what? A good man, a righteous man, a blameless man, right? And was he suffering or was he prospering in the beginning of the book? He was prospering. Look at verses 2 and 3 of our passage. He had what? Seven sons and three daughters. That's 10 children. 10 in in Hebrew literature is is a number that represents perfection and wholeness, right? It's just a nice whole number. And then look at the number of animals that he has. 7,000 sheep and uh, 3,000 camels. That's 10,000 sheep and camels. That's another nice whole round number. 500 oxen and 500 female donkeys. That's 1,000 oxen and female donkeys. That's another whole round number. Of course, it's not making the claim that it, the, he has these amount of animals at every single time. It's trying, to, it's trying to present to you that Job, the good man, the righteous man Job, was blessed by God with prosperity. His life was whole. Okay, well, if that's the case, the question's solved then, right? In the first five verses of our book, Proverbs is right, Ecclesiastes is wrong, the law of retribution holds up, Right? If a good guy like Job uh, gets blessing and prospers, that means the good will just simply prosper. But then you read on, and you go to chapter 2, and the principle of retribution is shattered. Because what happens in chapter 2? All of Job's prosperity is taken away by God through a sudden, unexpected calamity. Children die. His possessions are taken away. His savings are gone. His health collapses. Why? Did he somehow sin in between chapters 1 and 2? No, there's no indication of that. It actually says at the end of chapter 2 that he remained righteous. Okay, so then Ecclesiastes is right, I guess, right? There is no order, that it's random, that there's no such thing as retribution. If you're good or bad, it doesn't matter. You're going to be blessed or cursed randomly. But then, in case this isn't confusing enough, you skip to the very end of the book, chapter 42, and it says what? The Lord restored the fortunes of Job. So at the end, this good man is blessed by God and prospers. And the reader at this point is going, okay, come on, which one is it? Which one is it? Is Proverbs true that God orders life around this concept of fairness and simple retribution? Or is Ecclesiastes true and God orders the universe with no rhythm, no rhyme? What the book of Job is saying is this. That the principle of retribution and fairness, ultimately speaking, as it overarches the beginning of the book, as we read and studied just now, and as it also overarches the end of the book, ultimately, uh, uh, the simple law of retribution is right, is true. Proverbs is ultimately right. The book starts in chapter one with it. If you're good, you get blessed. If you're bad, you're good. And the end of the book ends with it, right? Job the righteous prospers. But during the middle of the story, chapters 2 to 41, Job the righteous suffers. In the middle of the story, life isn't as simple as good people prospering and bad people suffering. In the middle of the story, Ecclesiastes is true. Life is often messy, confusing, and often unfair. And friends, are we not experiencing this right now? Are we not in one of the messiest parts of the messy middle? And we're all trying to make sense of it, and the thing is we can't. We don't know why it's so messy. There seems to be no rhythm or rhyme. And not even the book of Job gives us a formula explanation of why the middle is so messy. It instead affirms that during this messy middle, we're never going to truly comprehend it, at least not now. There's a funny part of the book. When Job, you know, he, he was in the messy middle, 
And he does eventually lose it a little bit, and he starts accusing God of injustice, saying, this is unfair, you know, explain to me why this is happening, answer me. And God does answer back in chapter 40, and he says something really weird. God says to Job, behold, behemoth. And, and the reader goes, what? What's a behemoth? Well, it's, it's the hippo. It's a hippopotamus, okay? Hippos back then was a symbol of wild chaos, often used in ancient Near East literature to symbolize primordial chaos. What God is trying to tell Job here, what God's trying to tell us here, is that while we're still in the messy middle, during the middle of the story, the suffering we experience, it'll make as much sense to us as a wild hippo would. It's actions, it's movements, it's thought process and decision-making categories. You're not going to be able to make sense of it. It's going to look like a random mess to you. And is that not how a lot of us feel right now? Nothing makes sense. None of us does. Literally in the span of two weeks, everything changed. Without prejudice, this pandemic caused suffering on good people, bad people, religious people, non-religious people, honest people, dishonest people. It doesn't seem to care. Everyone, everyone is affected by this and no one can make sense of it. And the tendency that we have is to want to oversimplify it, is it not? And unfortunately, I have to confess, Christians, we do this a lot, don't we? We, we begin to make presumptuous, simplistic claims of, of why this is happening. You know, we say, oh, this is happening because God's punishing us for this very particular sin and this is happening because this very particular reason and... Or, you know, if we just pray hard enough, if we just, if we just repent and, and believe hard enough, it'll pass. We're not going to be affected that badly, and God's going to take it away. Now, all those things, sure, they sound religious and spiritual, and you may have Bible verses that you're connecting behind every claim, but really, it's speculation. Because you don't know. That's what God's telling us in this book. You don't know. For you to try and comprehend the macroeconomics of suffering right now is like an ant trying to comprehend the macroeconomics of global economy. You're never going to fully make sense of it, at least not right now. And all you will do, if you impose spe- speculations upon it, all you do is you're going to disappoint yourself and you're going to hurt others with presumptuous insensitivity. You've, you've heard it before, haven't you? people imposing their meaning upon your pain. You've lost your health and financial security because you lack faith or because you've committed this particular sin and God's punishing you because this or that. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that because you don't know. When you do that, all you're doing is heaping on extra hurt on already hurting people. Job had faith. He didn't sin, yet he lost everything. And I get it. I, I, I get the temptation to come up with speculative formulas because it gives us a sense of control in an uncontrollable situation, does it not? Especially in times like this, to have some sort of sense of control and to make sense of it, you know, it's a very desirable thing. But the book of Job doesn't give us a formula to control the messy middle. It gives us something better. It gives us a peek behind the curtains and it shows us that in the midst of the messiness in the middle, it was never out of control in the first place. It was never out of control in the first place. Look at verse 6. What do we see? Someone's still in control. In verse 6, you see God sitting confidently on his throne. Let's read verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God, angels there, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. See, see the picture here? He's not in panic. God's sitting on his throne. And who are these celestial beings, including Satan himself, reporting to? They're reporting to God. He's in control. And then look at verse 7. What does God do? Was, was God caught by surprise by Satan's schemes? No. In fact, he's the one who initiated the conversation with Satan in the first place. Look at verse 7. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? <laughs> and even more shocking, he's actually the one who brought Job to Satan's attention in the first place. Look at verse 8. Have you considered my servant Job? (laughs) 
Now, why would God do that? Does that not make him evil? If he's the one who initiated the messiness in Job's life, isn't he then the one to blame? Well, we'll get to that later, but, but for now, do you see what this passage is telling us? It's telling us God controls the hippo. God's in control. You're not meant to be in control of the messy middle. In, instead of trying to gaze unto revelations too great for us to fully comprehend, the rest of our passage says, it may be more fruitful at times of suffering when suffering comes your way to instead gaze inward and see what kinds of things our suffering reveals about us, which leads us to our second point, Job's unknown motivation. After God initiated a conversation with Satan regarding Job, look at how Satan responds in verses 9 to 11. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he'll curse you to your face. What Satan's saying here is that of course Job's blameless and upright. Of course he's religious. Look at all that you've given him. Look at all of his stuff. You've put a hedge around his house, meaning you've been protecting him. You've blessed the work of his hands, meaning you've given him a good career and his business is prospering. He has a good family. Of course he's going to praise you. What Satan's doing here is that he's claiming that Job is only religious because God's made him prosper. In other words, Satan's saying Job isn't religious because he loves God. Job is religious because he loves himself. In Indonesian, the word there is modus. Go ahead, God. Take it all away, Satan says in verse 11. Take away all of his comforts. Take away his career. Take away his money. Take away his health. Take away his freedom to leave the house whenever he wants. Take away his toilet paper. Take away his savings. Take away every material blessing you've ever given him. Watch. Watch. He will wave his fist to the heavens. He will start doubting your goodness and he'll curse you to your face. You will find that his religion is self-serving. What verses 9 to 11 of our passage tells us is that we may not be able to study the hidden realities behind our sufferings, but our sufferings will help reveal the hidden realities in our own lives. And these are the days, are they not? As hard as it is to admit, these are the days where we'll see whether or not we've been actually worshiping God for God or for the gifts he's given us. Now again, I'm not saying this is the reason of why God allows us to suffer. No, no. Remember, we don't want to speculate that far. But, but we, don't, we also don't want to be overly vague when the Bible does speak. I'm not saying this is the reason of, of why uh, suffering exists here in the messy middle, but I think it's safe to say from verses 9 to 11 that this is at least one way in which God uses our messiness and uses our suffering. It can reveal that we actually perhaps do doubt and question God's goodness instead of worship Him when times are hard. And, and this is it, right? Most people, I think, the main issue is not that they doubt the existence of, of a God, right? A lot of people say that in modernity or post-modernity in the age that we're in, the concept of God is going to die out eventually, but it really hasn't. Now, the concept of organized religion, that's definitely died down. But the concept of God, spirituality, the concept of some kind of being having some kind of control over the moral order of the universe, for the most part, people still believe that. And that's why during hard times like these, the question most people are asking, whether you're religious or not, is usually the question, why? Why? Why is this happening? Now think about it. If we're asking the question, why, presupposed behind that question is, is a belief in the concept of purpose and intention. You can't ask the question, why, without believing the, the, the concept of purpose. Just like it doesn't make sense to ask the question when unless you believe in the concept of time. Or it doesn't make sense to ask the question where unless you believe in the concept of space. When we ask the question why, we're assuming the concept of purpose exists. 
Now, okay, if the concept of purpose or intention exists, the deeper question is, who's purposing it? And what are the intentions behind that purpose? And that's why what gets put on the chopping block most in times like these is not God's ability to take away suffering, but it's his intentions of why it's here in the first place. And we doubt his goodness. And, and, and it's hard not to ask that question, right? Because he really is, in a real way, behind them if he exists. Look at verse 12. Most people want to relieve God of responsibility for Job's suffering by saying, oh, you know, God didn't do that. Satan did that. But, but if you read the passage, it clearly doesn't let God off the hook that easily. Look at verse 12. Who gave the orders? And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Go ahead. I give you permission to do it. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord only after he's been given permission to do so. And, and I get that. We, we read this and we go, And you're asking me to trust this guy? <laughs> he gave the orders. He let the hippo loose. How can I trust his intentions? And friends, that's, that's where we must not judge this story while we're still in the middle of the book. The last chapter of Job correlates with the first chapter of Job that we're in studying right now in that they both make sense. At the end, goodness is rewarded with goodness and evil is shunned. Job, the righteous, although he did go through a messy middle, ultimately at the end, is blessed and justice prevails. What the book of Job asks us to do is to not judge God too quickly while we're still in the messy middle, but wait till the end, which leads us to our last point, God's sure conclusion. Okay, if, if you read the end of the book of Job, chapter 42, you'll see that life there kind of makes sense again. At the end, Job, the righteous, is blessed, so the principle of retribution ultimately does stand. And if you read the last chapter of the book, it actually specifically says that Job at the end has even more blessings having gone through the messy middle compared to if he never went through it in the first place. And some of us may ask, well, I'm glad, you know, Job remained righteous and, and sinless through the messy middle, and I'm glad that because he remained righteous, he was rewarded at the end. I'm happy for him. I really am. But what about those, some of us may ask, what about those of us who, who fell into sin during the messy middle, like me? What about us who did not stay obedient to God? What, what about those who couldn't take the mess and doubted God's goodness, questioned his intentions? What about us who responded to pain and suffering in ways that are against his will? And even perhaps, what about us who did curse him to his face and fail to believe he is good in the midst of all this? What about us? Well, it's interesting to see that actually Job was one of us. He too sinned during the messy middle in chapters 3 to 41. It got too much for him. If you read the book, he did eventually question God. He questioned God's justice. He questioned God's goodness to where God even rebukes him in chapter 38, saying, who are you to question me? Job sinned in the messy middle. So then, how can Job be blessed in the end? If, if good is rewarded and sin is punished, then shouldn't Job, who sinned, be punished? In fact, shouldn't we all be punished? Who here can say, They've worshipped God for God, utterly, unwaveringly, completely, sincerely, purely, throughout the messy middle. So how did retribution escape sinful Job? Where did God's justice go? Who can claim utter purity and worship God in the middle of the suffering? Where is our retribution going to go? Is it going to go to us? Who can do this? Who can remain pure? No one, the Bible says, no one, except for one man. In the Bible, there was one person who was able to go through the messy middle, but yet remain sinless through it all. See, Job had his possessions taken away from him, and like us, he doubted God's goodness. But this man had his possessions taken away, and yet he said to God, let your will be done. He never doubted him. 
Job had his honor taken away, and like us, we question God's fairness. But yet this man was mocked and crucified by a whole nation. Yet he was still able to pray to God, saying, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. See, it's interesting. Look at the last verse of our passage, verse 12. And what you see there is God still holding back the full weight of messiness from Job. God gave permission to Satan to to do the worst to Job, but only against him do not stretch out your hand, meaning don't go all the way to killing him. But upon Jesus Christ, God didn't hold back at all. He heaped all of his wrath upon him, the point of death, even death on a cross. Why do people like us who sin in the messy middle, how can people like us who sin in the messy middle escape judgment? And why do we have hope like Job in the end? Because the only person who did not sin in the messy middle, the Bible says, took all of our judgment upon himself. Now, now again, I don't want to fall into the mistake of being too speculative of, you know, giving us information that the Bible doesn't tell us. I'm, I'm, not, so, I'm not saying this is the only reason for this mess. But again, I also don't want to be vague when the Bible does give us information. And on this point, I think the Bible does give us information that at least this is one way, if not the chief purpose of this mess. So that in and through it, God can show us at the end who he is and who we are in a way that we would have never grasped unless the messy middle existed. You read the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, you, you, you know what's waiting there for you, Christian, at the end of this mess? Not a detached God, unharmed by suffering, waiting for you in his comfortable chair, waving around the ticket of salvation for you to purchase with your own religiosity. You know what you find there? What's waiting there for you is a slain lamb whose body has been destroyed by the messy middle, bearing eternally the wounds of the cross upon his body. Why? Because he's pursued you to the depth of the mess himself. One of the ways in which God uses this mess is by displaying through it the cross, a public display of his love for you and a public display of your worth. A display that would never have existed unless the messy middle did. A love proven to you, not just by mere words, but through actual sacrifice. And Job says at the end of this book, after going through the messy middle, holding on to God, says this, I'd heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. I'm not speculating and saying this is the only use of the mess, but it is, the Bible says, one of its uses, if not the main use of it, the cross. Are there still questions unanswered? Of course, of course. Am I tempted to speculate or or question God's intentions at this time? Absolutely. But if the cross is true, then, as a preacher once said, then it proves that the God of the Bible is powerful enough to cause something to become much more beautiful, having once been broken, compared to if it was never broken in the first place. Because he used even the terrible cross to save sinners like us. And now, trusting in Christ and his cross, we can await the day when we see the beauty behind the pain revealed. And we can partake and hope in partaking in this. Why? Not because we've earned the right to do so by our own behavior and religiosity in the messy middle. We can have hope in this because God has launched himself to the middle of our mess and died on a cross and guarantees us the beauties to come as he take upon himself the ugliness we deserve. This is why the Christian can worship God for God and no longer paying, playing barter with him. He's, he's given you his life. What else is there left to give? Will you receive it? Will you trust him? I don't know where you're coming from. You're maybe hearing the gospel for the first time or maybe you've heard it multiple times before. 
wherever it is you're coming from, I pray that through this you may not only hear with your ears, but truly like Job, see with your eyes. See the cross. The God that uses suffering to make everything more beautiful. Will you receive him? Let's pray. Father, helpless we are in times like these. And although we don't have a full picture of the macroeconomics of suffering in this messy middle, I pray that the answers you do give us in the Bible, we hold on to. That somehow you're using this to make all things more beautiful, having once been broken, compared to if it was never broken in the first place. I don't get how, I don't get why. And to be honest, right now, it's hard for me to see how that justifies it. But I know that truth is not found in my own insides. Truth is not ultimately found in my gut, in my own inclinations and subjective perspective. Help me, help us hold on to the truth revealed from above as found in your word. And you're saying that you will make it all right and that you will one day, help us make sense of it and partake in the beauties behind the pain, not because we deserve it, but because you, the ultimate beauty, has come down and took upon our worst pain upon yourself and died in the messy middle in our stead. In this cross, in this gospel, in this Savior alone, we trust and place all our hopes as we live faithfully in this mess. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is no deed, there is no deed that can redeem us. There is no right, no magic word. salvation be secure it is finished he has done it let your weary heart rejoice our redemption is accomplished raise a shout with a ragged voice and go briefly into battle knowing he won the war it is finished lift your head and weep no more there's no sacrifice to offer there's no sacrifice to offer there's no penance to complete freely drink up living water without money come and feed it is finished he has done it let your weary heart rejoice our redemption is accomplished raise a shout with ragged voice and go bravely done it let your weary heart rejoice our redemption is accomplished raise a shout with a ragged voice and go bravely into battle knowing he has won the war it is finished lift your no more. Amen. 
Friends, I pray that God's word encouraged you. I pray that God's word helped you. Uh, and I hope that you do see him clearer now, not just with the hearing of the ears, but somehow with the eyes of your heart as his word has been preached to us today. Receive now, Christian, your benediction and go out. Well, I guess I should stay. Stay home, living out this truth to whoever it is God wants you to live it out with currently in your household and have peace, a peace that is beyond understanding, a peace in a God who controls the suffering and purposes it for a greater thing than we know now, purposes it for our good, for his glory. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go in his peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Oh